Hello and welcome. My name is Chris Cam with Mining Journal and with me I have Ashley Gibson, Technical Director and Energy Transition Lead with SLR Consulting and this is part of our climate program. Today we're looking at the key power sources for the mining sector, how they're evolving and where we can see win-win scenarios for multiple stakeholders. Welcome Ashley. Thanks, Chris. Great to connect with you today and uh, good to see you. And, and uh, for all the, uh, the, the listeners and viewers out there, um, hello and uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Ashley, I wanted to start around uh, scope two and the basic element of mine sites, where they get their power from. Um, how closely are miners working with utilities and governments on making that power source greener, that fundamental power source greener when they're getting it off the grid? And is there an opportunity uh, where it's not off the grid for, particularly in the developing world, for miners to help build green power solutions that could feed into communities and can help governments actually deliver on some of the policies and the club objectives that they're promising that perhaps they're not sure uh, how they're going to uh, make a reality. Yeah, Chris, I think, uh, yeah, a couple of questions there. I think we'll break it down into a couple of parts. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, scope two emissions are those indirect emissions that come from the, the local electricity grid and the amount of electricity a mine uh, uses. Um, I think the influence and the working relationship that miners have with utilities and governments really depends on a number of uh, factors. I mean, it depends on the structure of the local power market and the size of the mining operation, what their energy needs are in relation to that local electricity grid, and also the size of the mine in relation to the local economy. Obviously, the ones with a bigger size related to local economy will have more, more influence, and, uh, and they can offer up um, uh, sort of more, uh, more options, I think, for the, for the, for the local uh, community as well when they're, when they're larger. Um, when we talk about uh, developing country uh, mining operations, um, there's a lot of options out there. Uh, I think in deregulated de de markets, we see a lot of virtual power purchase agreements uh, starting to happen. It's become quite popular in the last couple of years. I mean, virtual power purchase agreement is where a mining company is helping do a deal with a renewable energy company who may be developing a wind or solar project that may be 100 more or more kilometres away, it's connected down the wires to the mine and there's a set price and a set period of time in which that VPPA will, will run for. And obviously that's green electricity for, uh, for the mine. Um, and then sometimes there's going to be opportunities to generate uh, renewable power uh, on the site itself. It really depends on the size of the lease, what available land area, what's the solar wind energy potential. Um, is there, are there any hydroelectric opportunities? Uh, that sort of thing. Um, so I think there's lo lots of options out there. I, I think it's uh, up to each mine to look at closely working with stakeholders, including utilities, including governments, including the local community to weigh up all of those options in totality in a big systems view and, uh, and, 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 and consider op what the options from there and then distill it down to what works best as a, as a pathway to, to net zero for a mine. From your experience, are you seeing a lot of collaboration or are you seeing a change or a gear shift in companies collaborating with the utilities and with the government to try and work together on what these solutions look like? Yeah, I, I think in, in some locations, uh, yes. In other locations where uh, the mining company might have limited influence, then I, I see mining companies taking uh, things into their own hands a little bit and looking internally and saying, okay, if we source power from outside, uh, this is the sort of emissions intensity that we're going to have to bear. What are the options on our own mine site to develop uh, renewable energy resources and generate our own power? And uh, can that be done economically uh, within, uh, within the mining operation? And then what partners can we bring to the table in the private sector to, uh, to, to help with that? I think, um, I think yeah, seeing, seeing a bit of both. I think it really depends on what the jurisdiction, uh, how it's set up uh, for, uh, for working together in, in different ways. So, I mean, not, without singling out necessarily individual countries or uh, jurisdictions, are there parts of the world that seem to be doing this well or where there are certain 
uh, fundamental requirements that you need to have if you're going to start building these types of projects that we're talking about or ways that you're collaborating with uh, with government and utilities and, and parts of the world where it's a bit more difficult? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so let's consider, say, um, Chile, for example. Uh, Ch Chile has... Uh, uh, Chilean government has really gone quite aggressive in terms of putting out renewable energy options and trying to build out more, um, you know, wind and solar capacity on the grid. I mean, it makes a lot of sense in somewhere like Chile, where you have huge um, wind and solar energy uh, uh, potential. Um, and one of the big consumers of electricity in, in Chile is, is the mining sector. I mean, on a GDP basis, mining sector is one of the bigger percentages of uh, of the total economy compared to other countries. And so that's where there's, it's very significant uh, in terms of the overall. And so you see some good close working relationships happening uh, between mining companies and, uh, and, and governments and utilities. Um, so I think Chile Chile's a, definitely a good, a good example of that. Okay, and we're talking obviously mainly here, we're, we're talking about renewables. It's kind of solar farms and, and wind farms and hydroelectric, that kind of thing. Um, you've done a fair bit of work uh, around green hydrogen. And I'm going to quote you back to yourself, Ashley, here, if you don't mind. Um, you've described it as the single most promising development towards filling the void in the hard to decarbonise areas of our mining operations. Why does it have more potential than wind or solar or more established renewables? at the moment and how far away do you think we are from it becoming a commercial reality given that we have had a few false dawns with hydrogen going back several decades? So firstly, I don't think green hydrogen is that silver bullet one uh, solution to all of our uh, clean energy uh, problems to get us to net zero. It's, it's gonna be part of the mix. And we should think about green hydrogen as being complementary to wind and solar energy. I mean, green hydrogen by definition we need to create the hydrogen from renewable energy resources. So we need to think about it as a big system. And I think uh, green hydrogen, because it, I, I think I see it quite being quite attractive because it can be quite versatile. It can be used for um, generation of electricity uh, back again uh, through fuel cell use in say mobile uh, um, equipment uh, for electric drives. Uh, but it can be also used directly for combustion in, in engines, so for, for, for generators, um, and also for heat. So combustion systems that require heat, you know, you're burning the hydrogen similar to what you might be burning natural gas. Yes, the, the combustion, the combustor is a little bit different, but lots of uh, vendors coming out uh, in the market now with uh, solutions uh, for those things to, uh, to make that a reality. So I think it's... Um, also that hydrogen can be a bit of a, uh, a battery, a bit of an energy storage uh, device on a, on a complete system, where if you're generating wind and solar, that's an intermittent form of energy. If you convert that intermittency into something that uh, can be used over a set period of time more evenly, hydrogen can be that intermittent energy storage form that you can use then um, to, to level out your sort of supply and demand on, not, on your energy within, um, within an operation. I think, yeah, I mean, for sure there are challenges with uh, developing any new, new technology. Um, I mean, hydrogen, it's, I mean, it's got a lower net natural um, energy density, I should say, lower energy density, say, compared to, say, natural gas. I mean, it's only got one third of the energy density. So in terms of transporting it and storing it, yeah, there's, challenge, there's challenges there. Um, that's where I think we also need to look at other energy forms that contain hydrogen, like ammonia. I mean, ammonia being a molecule of nitrogen and hydrogen, um, where it's easier to store, easier to transport. And so I, I think when we think about hydrogen, we also need to think about ammonia. Um, but going back to hydrogen, um, I mean, electrolysis is the way to produce hydrogen from renewables at the moment. And, uh, and we see... Uh, that supply chain really starting to grow in, in earnest. Uh, but in terms of producing hydrogen via electrolysis, we've got to think about that we need nine parts water to one part hydrogen. Where's a mine site going to get its water from? 
Um, you know, in, in some locations, uh, water is is uh, is a very precious resource. So that that's a very important uh, sort of potential constraint uh, to think about water management for a mining operation if there if if hydrogen is going to be considered. And um, and, I, and I think you, each mining operation can can look at it. It might might work for some, and it might not work for uh, for others. So. I, as I say, not one silver bullet, but because of its versatility, I think that's why it's most promising. Okay, so I mean, just to make make sure I'm clear on, I mean, essentially, we're looking at it as a an extra tool or an extra arrow in the quiver when we're generating our power from renewables and, and other sources that we have. Um, hydrogen provides that versatility to convert the energy into a range of different options or to facilitate a range of different options around a mine site and then obviously feeding into a mine site as scope to emissions as well. Oh, sorry, to manage scope to emissions as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I mean, in terms of relying on scope to emissions where you might be bringing in, you're, you're gonna have lesser reliance on diesel coming in. Um, you know, it's part of your scope to emissions, um, your, uh, your grid electricity that might still be relying on a lot of coal-fired power, uh, for example. If you have the resources available on site to put in wind and solar, and then also generate uh, green hydrogen in a distributed energy configuration, then yeah, it can drastically reduce uh, your scope to emissions. And we're talking about a lot of great things, but we're also talking about quite significant investments for a lot of companies. You touched on the scale of miners previously. A lot of that is around uh, the life of a mine. And clearly it's a great start to get a handle and start to mitigate and bring down emissions at large long running mines. But there are a lot of small mines with short mine lives that also need to be making progress. How do you see that development of this technology and these processes and understanding and the responsibility of bringing that technology forward and making it a reality? Does it need to be proven and established at large mines where there are long mine lives where the return of investment makes sense, usually with large companies, and then scaled back and applied to smaller mines? Or do you think that there is a, an opportunity for small mines to be making sensible investments and starting to move it forward for you know, a, sh a short mine life, five or six years? Can they be done in tandem or does it need to happen where there is really the most capital and opportunity? Yeah, good. Uh, another good question there, Chris. Um, I, I mean, I agree with you that the longer life mines, the ones that are more profitable, are going to have more options uh, that they can consider uh, in terms of uh, you know self developing the technologies and more investment into research and development. Uh, I mean, we see that with the likes of uh, Anglo American, you know, Fortescue uh, Metals uh, doing, uh, or FFI, I should say, Fortescue Future. Future Industries, their partner, um, doing these types of uh, projects. Yes, lots of in, lots of resources at their disposal to uh, to make it happen. Uh, for smaller miners, yes, more challenging. But then I, my mind goes to the supply chain and what's happening in the supply chain and all the exciting things that are happening in new technologies that are coming through. And uh, there's a lot of competitors in that supply chain that the smaller miners need to, uh, need, need to leverage. I mean, let's think about a lot of the smaller mining operations. The reason why they get off the ground is a, a lot of uh, the assets um, are leased uh, over time. And I, and I think um, that sort of leasing agreement will lend itself to other types of technologies like you know, the electrolysis units. We see a lot of those being modularized now into megawatt scale you know, containers. Um, as well as the water purification that's uh, that's needed for that, um, I think we, we, I think miners need to look at their supply chain, who are really coming out with new um, new options and new, new niche technology developments. They are investing heavily. They they see the writing on the wall that they need. They're responding to the challenge, and I think it's up to every miner to look at their supply chain and uh, look look at what's out there, and if they need to change around some, some suppliers, then uh, that's, the, that's the way to do it and come to agreements. So I think the other thing that's really interesting now is uh, from the perspective of a full circular economy, 
the people, the, the companies out there that are using uh, mines sort of metal products are the renewable energy sort of companies who are producing all this equipment. So I think the, the best miners are the ones that are bringing together uh, that circular economy's perspective and, and, and bringing those renewable energy um, product uh, companies to the table and developing these projects where um, there's a bit of a partnership and a risk sharing um, of, uh, of, of the development of, of, the, of the new technologies uh, to get us to net zero. So it's, 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 there's a lot of activity in the market right now. And I, I think uh, we're seeing some really good um, developments, lowering of costs uh, for, for some of these. I think similar to uh, what we've seen in, in say wind and solar where the capital cost of wind and solar energy has come down around 85% in the last 10 years. I think we'll see the same happen uh, in uh, electrolysis systems or ways of producing green hydrogen in the, in the next five years. There's going to be a scale up of manufacturing that's going to increase efficiency. And then um, with more competition coming to the market, costs are going to come down in, the, in that area. I think there's enough momentum in the, in the market now with enough companies uh, all participating that uh, we've got you know, we're off to the races and we're going to see some uh, some big changes. Ashley Gibson, thanks very much for your time. Cheers, Chris.